Okay, anything I should clarify before I move on? Any lingering questions? Yes, about the working conditions? Yep. Uh, you, you can, can you impose a different working condition for its term of expansion, or you are constrained to the same? So you can, uh, so there's uh, some latitude in how you wish to, uh, to do this. So you could think of the according condition as coming at every order in lambda, and then you could do you know, something different at that order, or you could think of imposing according condition at all orders in lambda. Uh, so you know, probably the most, uh, here, the, um, the most familiar example in what would be done in, so in linearized gravity, we were adopting the divergence-free condition. And that's something I could think of imposing either just at order epsilon or at high orders too. So I could choose to include as many orders as I want in that coordinate expression. If I wanted to generalize this to any curve space-time from a different solution, I could think of imposing um, the covariant version of that equation where I'm thinking of this as a derivative operator in the background space-time. And again, I could choose this to describe that purely at order lambda or at many orders, all of them together, or I could choose to do something different at each order. So I have you know, a lot of latitude in, in doing this. So yeah, so the, the, the practical uh, choice of imposing a coordinate condition can be something that's part of the, you know, you know, the art of doing perturbation theory, you try to come up with a way that will help you the most. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the standard choices in, 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 as, I, as I keep going. Does that help you a bit? Uh, yes. Uh, for example, the, the, the red simply condition, no? Yeah. Uh, for uh, some general background, uh, maybe you can't impose that condition, no? Uh, the, the background needs to satisfy. I, I, I'm thinking on preparation of rotational waves, no? On yeah. A curved background. Yeah. If the background is weakly curved, uh, you can you can impose this this condition, no? But if you have a more strange background, maybe. Uh, no, I mean, so you, I think you could do it for any background. You could certainly do it for Schwarzschild. You can set up a Schwarzschild perturbation problem and impose the diverge, divergence-free condition in Schwarzschild. And that's just a perfectly fine thing to do. It may not be very helpful. It might be something you would like to avoid, and people tend to avoid that, you know, unless they do self-force. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, even in self-force, there's a lot of, you know, lots of different coordinate conditions that get to be uh, imposed. So yeah, lots of lots of ways. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm still uh, so I'm still in this the general framework of doing perturbation in general relativity, and what I you know explain here is what I would call a rather unsophisticated approach to doing perturbation theory that would suit someone like me very well, a very pragmatic uh, physicist who uh, doesn't care about, you know, the fancy language of manifolds and things like that. But sometimes I show up at work and for some reason I pretend that I'm an applied mathematician and I try to look at things from a different point of view and I, you know, I, I get uh, really, really, uh, you know, involved in, you know, describing this from a better point of view, I, I don't want to say better, but a different, you know, point of view more rooted in differential geometry, and I wanted to convey some of that to you because I think it's very pretty. For practical things, it doesn't tell, it tend to help you very much, but to think well uh, in terms of conceptual things, uh, I think it can be really uh, helpful to think along those lines. So I want to describe the uh, geometrical aspects of doing perturbation theory. Um, in a way that would be more rooted in differential geometry and the way that uh, was, you know, so in a way that would please better the mathematical relativist uh, more than the physicist. So, as we saw, so the whole business of doing perturbation theory is to say let's start from a metric we know and let's get to a metric that's going to be a perturbation from that metric. So we take, you know, epsilon, we take lambda equals zero, that's the background solution, and we lift it up to lambda equals uh, epsilon. So that's what we're doing, uh, but if we think of this in terms of differential geometry, we have to think of space-times, uh, 
as a union of a manifold and a metric. So if I think along those lines, I have to think of my background space-time as being the union of a base manifold and a base metric. And I have to think of my perturbed space-time as the union of, well, another manifold and another metric. I could think of formulating two metrics on the same manifold, but from what I'm about to describe, it's really useful to describe the background space-time and the perturbed space-time as having their own manifold. So I'm going from one manifold to another manifold as I go from one metric to the other metric. So I do the two operations together. If I want to describe this in the same language I did before, what I have to think about is doing this in a one-parameter family. So I really want to introduce this one-parameter family of space signs being the union of a lambda-dependent manifold with a lambda-dependent metric, and that will slide from the zero uh, metric and you know the zero spacetime to the perturbed spacetime. And when I'm doing this, I'm basically introducing a whole stack of manifolds, one on top of each other, going from zero to lambda. And if you think a little bit about this, what I'm describing here is no longer just one four-dimensional space-time. I'm introducing a whole succession of four-dimensional space-times, and I'm basically constructing a five-dimensional manifold with a new dimension being described by lambda. By going from zero to epsilon, I'm taking one manifold to the other manifold to the other manifold, so I'm building a foliation of a five-dimensional manifolds with two boundaries, one at epsilon and one at zero. So you see that it starts to you know, be very attractive from uh, a mathematical point of view, and it turns out that uh, it's a very nice way of thinking of how to do perturbation theory. So what we have here is a five-dimensional manifold, and each manifold and lambda can be thought of as an embedded manifold in that five-dimensional structure. So I have a foliation, and each manifold and lambda is you know, a hypersurface in that five-dimensional structure. When we do perturbation theory, typically we think of the metric, but we might think of any tensor that lives in the background space-time that will eventually get promoted to the entire set of space-times that I have going from zero up to epsilon. So I might be thinking, for example, as the Riemann tensor. I have a Riemann tensor on the base manifold, and I have a Riemann tensor on each manifold between zero and epsilon, and I can follow the perturbation of that Riemann tensor going from the zeroth manifold to the epsilon manifold. I can follow the Riemann tensor going off in that fifth dimension going along lambda. When we do perturbation theory, we want to compare that Riemann tensor that lives up here to the Riemann tensor that lives down here. And if I want to do this, well, I have to you know, find ways to compare tensors on different manifolds. And that requires a structure that we need to put in place to be able to do this comparison. And that's called the identification map. So basically, I have to you know, compare a tensor at a point on this manifold with a tensor at a point on that manifold. I can only do this if I know how to make the points correspond to one another. So the whole game of perturbation theory is to really establish this identification map between the upper manifold and the base manifold in such a way that I can meaningfully describe a difference between a tensor here and a tensor there. So that's the language that gets introduced to, uh, to introduce uh, you know, a perturbation of a tensor. You introduce this five-dimensional uh, you know, manifold, extended manifold, and you think of each space-time between the base manifold and the perturbed manifold as being uh, an embedded sub-manifold in that, in that structure. So how do you do an identification map? So uh, here's a picture of what's going on. I'll go back to that side. For now, so here's the base manifold, so that's where I know how to do an exact solution to the SM field equations. So, for example, that would be my Schwarzschild space time right here. That would be the perturbed version of my space time when lambda is equal to epsilon. And this is my one parameter family of space times that takes me from the base space time to the perturbed space time. I have tensors that live down here, and I have tensors that live up here. And I want to be able to compare one from the other because the perturbation of that tensor will be the difference between the tensor here and the tensor there. So that idea, I think, is, uh, you know, is, uh, is, fairly, uh, is fairly intuitive. 
But what makes this uh, you know, a little bit challenging is that tensors are defined at points. So if I want to compare a tensor up here to a tensor down here, I have to specify at which points I do that. So that's why I have to introduce this identification map between points on the base manifold and base on the perturbed manifold. And I can only compare tensors on each manifold after I've introduced this, uh, this identification map. So what do we do to do this? Well, we're thinking five-dimensionally. So we have this five-dimensional manifold. And what we can introduce in that five-dimensional manifold is a vector field. A vector field that will be pointing transverse to all the, uh, the sub-manifolds that we have here, and, uh, and a vector field that will be pointing basically from here up to here. So that's, that's the vector field V here that I'm introducing in five-dimensional manifold. And what turns out to be really important here is not the vector field itself, but the integral curves that come from that vector field. So what I can do is to integrate the vector field that's given to me to define all the integral curves, and the integral curves will take me from a point here to a point up here. And it's through the integral curves that I can identify a point on the base manifold with a base, uh, with a point here on the perturbed manifold, and all the points in between. In order to compare things up here to things down here, and do that at a point, I have to define what it means for a point here to be related to a point down here, and that I can do once I have the vector field by using the integral curves. And of course, I'm assuming that the vector field is you know, non-singular, there's no crossing of integral field lines or anything, of integral lines, so I have this very nicely defined congruence of integral lines, and I can therefore follow each curve like this and associate on each submanifold here uh, a point uh, that's going to be related to a point on the base map. So the idea of doing perturbation theory in this language is to say, well, we have tensors up here, we have tensors down here, I will compare the tensors by uh, relating the value here to the value here, following each one of those integral curves. That's the nice differential geometry way of looking at doing perturbation theory. And again, on a conceptual level, I find that very, uh, very appealing. And I find from time to time it's good to remind myself of that because sometimes I face little challenges doing practical things that uh, can be resolved if I were to adopt a more geometrical point of view on what I'm trying to do. And in fact, in the next slide, I'll show you uh, the, you know, the geometrical point of view on coordinate conditions and coordinate transformations that I find very useful uh, you know, to clarify my thinking. All right, so we have the vector field, we have the integral curves. The integral curves will be parameterized by lambda. Lambda takes me from zero to epsilon, so I follow the curves by increasing lambda. And then I have you know, identification of a point here to a point there by just following the integral curves. So that's the basic idea. And once you have that, well, now you can do comparisons of tensors. So if I'm going back to my generic tensor Q that could stand for the metric or could stand for the Riemann tensor, or anything like that, I'm not displaying indices here, I could define the perturbation in the tensor to be the lambda derivative of my one parameter family of tensors uh, as lambda goes from zero to epsilon, but I'm evaluating all the derivatives at, uh, at lambda equals zero. So again, that familiar idea that we introduced before in many different contexts uh, can be just you know, adapted to that more geometrical point of view. The key difference here is that now I know precisely what I mean by a lambda derivative because, uh, you know, remember that lambda is the parameter on the integral curves, and that means that the vector field d, which gives me the integral curves, is precisely the vector d d lambda. If I'm thinking of v the vector field as a tangent vector, it's tangent to the, uh, to the, uh, to the integral curves, and that means that differentiating with respect to lambda is differentiation along the vector field itself. And for those of you who know the derivatives, well, the geometrical idea that captures this, this differentiation along lambda is precisely the lead derivative. So from a, from a five-dimensional point of view, what I'm dealing with here is a tensor field in the five-dimensional manifold being lead differentiated along the vector field that takes me from the base manifold to the perturbed manifold. And if I evaluate that lead derivative at lambda equals zero, that's the same thing as taking the partial derivative uh, 
And that defines what I mean by a perturbation. So now, uh, so thinking about it this way, you know that a perturbation depends on the fact that we have different manifolds. That's the key thing. But the perturbation is also defined in terms of this identification map. So we absolutely need this to be able to establish a correspondence between points on different manifolds. And that's what the vector field does, and that's what the parameter does uh, as we follow the integral terms. When I've introduced one vector field, nothing prevents me from thinking of doing this all over again with a different vector field. I have a lot of freedom in choosing that one vector field that will take me from the base manifold to the uh, preferred manifold. So instead of choosing V, I could have chosen W. And if I introduce, you know, if I introduce a different vector field W, I'll have a different set of integral curves. Uh, the first set was denoted phi, the new set will be denoted psi. And that uh, gives me different ways of going from the base point to the perturbed manifold. If I follow the V integral curves, I end up here. If I follow the W integral curves, I end up up here. So there's nothing unique about V. I could trade V for W. I could trade W for U. It really you know, doesn't matter how you do it. The point is that we have this freedom in choosing how to identify points down here to points up here. And I think that geometrical view of things, when you think five-dimensionally, uh, is really you know, the perfect way conceptually to understand coordinate freedom, gauge transformations, uh, coordinate uh, conditions, and all of this. Because what I'm describing here is precisely the same sort of freedom that I talked about before of changing the perturbation by changing the coordinates. But here I'm describing this in a way that is a lot more compelling geometrically in terms of different identification maps between points here and points up here. It's pretty clear that we have lots of ways we can associate a point here to a point up here. All of those ways are equi equi uh, equivalent, they're equally valid. And if we want to compare tensors up here with tensors up here, of course it's gonna matter which identification map I introduce to do that. And uh, that, in fact, is the gauge freedom that I was talking about before. Two perturbations may look very different, but they may look different just because I've used two different ways of identifying points from the base manifold to the upper manifold. In fact, we can make this a lot more precise and think of a little exercise. We can think of calculating the difference between two perturbations that are obtained from two different ident uh, identification maps. So I have one up here that compares the tensor here to the tensor up here. I have this other one over here that compares the tensor here to uh, the tensor up here. So I have two different perturbations because in the first instance I'm comparing tensors at those two points. And in the second instance I'm comparing tensors at those two points. And of course I should expect different answers because I'm talking about different points on the upper manifold corresponding to the same point on the base manifold. So one perturbation will be described in terms of phi. The other perturbation will be described in terms of psi. Two different identification maps. If I take the difference, I'm taking the difference between two Lie derivatives. The difference of two Lie derivatives is the Lie derivative of the difference in the two vector fields. So it's the Lie derivative of V minus W. Still acting on the you know, five-dimensional uh, extended uh, you know, tensorial object. If I then, I'm not indicating this here, but I'm evaluating all of this at lambda equals zero, I'm calculating the Lie derivative of two vectors that take me off the manifold. And if you think a little bit about it, that difference between two vectors that take you off the base manifold has to be a tangent vector to the manifold. So that difference between V and W evaluated on the base manifold has to be a vector that's tangent to the base manifold. So instead of calling it V minus W, I'll just call it C. And that tells me that if I have two identification maps, I will have two different perturbations that will differ from one another by a Lie derivative of the original unperturbed tensor. If I apply this to the metric, that's exactly the same transformation property that we described before. The uh, two metric perturbations might differ from one another and be strictly physically equivalent if they differ by a Lie derivative term, and that holds true not just for the metric, but it's true for any tensor. 
So, uh, so this little construction here, uh, you know, really tells you a lot about how to think about gauge transformations and think about all of this in a nice geometrical way. And practically speaking, it's very nice because it tells you that the transformation property for any tensor, the perturbation of any tensor, the difference between two different identifications will always be a derivative. So knowing this, you don't have to think very hard. You know precisely how the metric will transform under two different maps. You know exactly how the Riemann tensor will transform under, uh, under two different maps like this. So you know precisely how to relate perturbations that are related to one another by different identification maps. So I find that, uh, you know, that find, uh, I find that view very compelling and very you know, helpful in clarifying what all of this means. So if you look at this from an applied mathematician point of view, I think you'll find that appealing. If you're like me, uh, you'll find that as soon as you go home, you forget about this and start calculating stuff. And, uh, and it's only when you get stuck somehow on a conceptual matter that it might be actually a good idea to go back and think uh, geometrically about these things. Yep? What happens when you have a scale density? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you ask again? What happens when you have a scale density? Oh, okay. Cell tensor, so that the minus. For example, the levity tensor. Or pseudo tensor. Um, I don't think so. Let's see. So the so right. So if you're dealing with tensor densities, then you can certainly so you can certainly define the derivative operation on, on density. And, uh, and then anything follows because there's nothing about this that really could be dependent on the tensorial nature of Q. So I think it would work for densities. And I think if it would work for densities, it would work with either sweet or pseudo pseudo tensors. I think it all follows, uh, so no, no change in the So thank you for the question, Terry. It took me a while to understand. Yeah. Because, yeah, because that's how I, I define the perturbation. I'm taking the, uh, so it's, yeah, it's the difference between the tensors at, uh, so it's the limit of the difference between two tensors at the base manifold. So it's, it's always defined in terms of that lambda derivative, evaluated at lambda equal to zero. So the perturbation is defined as that limit where you approach the, uh, the base manifold. So you, you not know the difference between these perturbations for all the uh, so, so strictly speaking, the perturbation is defined as a tensor on this manifold. But of course, this presumes that you have access to the whole one parameter family of tensors. So, in that sense, you can always take a numerical difference between the value at, you know, say, lambda equals one and lambda equals zero. So that that you can always do. But that's tricky because now you're comparing tensors at uh, at, at different points on different manifolds. So that so we have to. Be careful about things like that. Okay. But yeah, so here, you know, the so this is basically just a a way of thinking geometrically about taking this lambda derivative, thinking of that as a lead derivative in the direction of the vector field going from base to uh, to a lambda. Other questions? So one uh, so one. Um, aspect of this that comes out, so a corollary to that, is that um, this equation tells you when you might expect a perturbation to be independent of the identification map. So who can tell me under what conditions you might expect that to be true? When the lead derivative is zero, right? So if you have a tensor that happens to have a vanishing lead derivative for any vector on the base manifold, then, uh, then, uh, the, uh, then of course that's going to be zero. But the only tensor that so the only tensor that can be that can have a vanishing lead derivative for any tangent vector c would be the zero tensor. So if you start with the tensor that happens to be zero on the base manifold, then you can guarantee that any perturbation of that tensor will be the same under two different uh, identification maps. So that's a fancy way of saying that if your tensor is zero on the base manifold, the perturbation of that tensor will be gauge invariant. 
its perturbation will not depend on how you go from here to here. An example of this would be, well, when you do perturbation theory on Minkowski space-time, your Riemann tensor is zero on the base manifold. It's not going to be zero on the perturbed manifold, but the perturbation of the Riemann tensor will be unique. It will be gauge invariant. It will not change if you do a small change in the coordinates. And that's basically guaranteed by this little uh, theorem. So, uh, so zero tensors are very good because they're gauge invariant quantities. Anything, so a perturbation of zero tensor will not be zero, but that perturbation will be independent of the choice of identification map, and that makes it a gauge invariant tensor in this, uh, in this way of thinking about it. So I find it compelling, I find it nice, but usually it doesn't help me calculate things, only it's when I get stuck. Uh, and I have to think conceptually about what I'm trying to do that I find, use, I find it useful to, uh, to put my applied mathematician's hat and think of it that way. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you in terms of generalities. And at this stage, you pretty much know what it means to do perturbation theory about any background metric. So you start from any uh, exact solution. And in principle, you would know how to construct a perturbation and, uh, and at least carry out the perturbation to first order. Uh, that's just a matter of calculation. You are aware of the coordinate uh, issues that, uh, that get involved, and now you have this geometrical understanding of this based on this five-dimensional view of the perturbation and that choice of identification map that you can make if you go from one manifold to the other manifold. So I think now you're well-equipped to do something concrete, and that's going to be about doing perturbation theory for a Schwarzschild black hole. So now we're getting dirty, we're getting concrete. So uh, I'll get started that today, and uh, we'll see how far we go, and we'll, you know, we'll do more tomorrow. So let's give, uh, let's give ourselves a, a context here, because I don't want to work without a goal. So let's say that you're interested in calculating gravitational waves that would be coming off, uh, be coming off of a particle orbiting a black hole. And here I really want to go deep. I, I don't want to consider uh, an example where you could work it out in terms of post newtonian theory. I really want to go and look at an orbit that would be in the deep, strong field of the Schwarzschild solution. So you've all seen diagrams like this that would be the effective potential for particle motion in the Schwarzschild space-time. You probably can't read the numbers, but I've chosen orbital parameters here such that the innermost radius is around four times the Schwarzschild radius. So you're really, really close to the black hole. And the outer radius of the orbit is about 11 times the Schwarzschild radius. So we're really you know, deep in the strong field gravity of the Schwarzschild black hole. We have an eccentric orbit that goes from this innermost turning point to this outermost turning point. And if you look at the shape of the orbit, uh, it looks like this. So it spends a little time over here with the smaller radii, then it comes out again, and now it moves with that uh, you know, larger radius, and it keeps you know, going back and forth between the innermost point and the outermost point over here, and it traces an orbit that looks like this. As Alessandro was pointing out this morning, if you do this in the deep field of the black hole, uh, the periastron advance during each orbit is not a, mighty, you know, a tiny fraction of uh, 2 pi. It's actually a very substantial fraction of 2 pi. So that's why the orbit doesn't repeat itself, and it goes, you know, it really advances like this after each orbit. So I think that's an example of an orbit that you know, really tells you something about the deep uh, gravitational field of the black hole. You wouldn't get an orbit like this in post theory because post theory would you know, break down well before you can reach those highly, highly uh, you know, fast motion type situations. And if you wanted to calculate gravitational waves from a system like this, well, you couldn't rely on the quadrupole approximation. You couldn't rely on even the most advanced version of the post-Newtonian uh, expression for the waveform. You certainly would, want to would not want to rely on the quasi-circular approximation because this is a highly eccentric orbit. So basically, you need to come up with a much better way of calculating this. And uh, I claim that the way to handle this problem would be to uh, do perturbation theory. Because in this situation, we have a tiny body, a very small mass, orbiting in uh, the Schwarzschild a metric of the very large black hole. So we have a small perturbing mass that's going to create a very small perturbation around the Schwarzschild solution. 
And it's that perturbation that will propagate out to infinity and manifest itself there as a gravitational wave. So if you want to calculate the gravitational waves, you know, very accurately coming from a situation like this, you have to rely on black hole perturbation theory. And it's you know, really the ideal tool and pretty much the only tool at your disposal to do a calculation like this. And those would be the waves that you get out. So if I do the perturbation problem, and I'll show you how to do the perturbation problem, and saw it through the end, and looked at you know, the way that the perturbation behaves at infinity, while well, it behaves as a gravitational wave, and you see two polarizations uh, you know, emerging from that, the plus and the cross polarizations, one blue, uh, one red, and you would see a wave pattern that looks exactly like this. So you would have this high amplitude, high frequency portion of the wave that comes out when the particle is very close to the black hole moving on the you know, inner part of the orbit down here. And then uh, you would have this low amplitude, low frequency part of the wave that comes out when the particle is moving at large distance away from the black hole in the neighborhood of the outermost turning point here. So that waveform with its you know, very, very specific features here and this you know, alternation between high frequency, high amplitude, low frequency, low amplitude, uh, you know, uh, phenomenology here would be a diagnostic of this orbit. And by observing the waves, in principle, you could say something about the orbit and infer the orbital parameters of that body. So it's all about looking at the waves to say something about the source. Normally, we do this for circular orbits uh, in simpler conditions, but there's nothing stopping you from thinking that uh, you know, for in the context of the space-based detectors, for example, there would be observations coming from highly eccentric systems that are still highly eccentric by the time they move close, and they would produce waves like this, and, uh, and if you wanted to calculate those waves, well, you would have no choice but to rely on black hole perturbation theory. I claim that Poisson-Tonian theory will never do justice to something like this. You may, you know, come up with some fairly decent approximation to this, but if you want the exact thing, uh, exact in the sense of, you know, a good approximation to the exact thing, uh, then uh, black, hole theory, you know, black hole perturbation theory is the way to go. So the whole, you know, sequence of slides uh, that will follow, and we won't finish the job today, but we'll finish tomorrow, is all about thinking about how to set up a calculation like this and do it step by step in, uh, in order to eventually get to those waveforms uh, and... Uh, so that, that's, that's my goal. So that's the context for what I'm about to describe. Of course, I won't forget anything that we've talked about before. The same ideas will resurface, but now we're going to be in that much more concrete uh, you know, situation. So that's what we want to do. So conceptually, all I have to do is to apply to Schwarzschild what I was describing before in a very general way. So we start out with Schwarzschild solution. That's going to be our base metric living on the base manifold. We all know the Schwarzschild metric. I'm going to write it here in, uh, in the standard coordinates. And F is going to be my metric element. It's 1 minus 2m over r. I'm writing it in you know, normal Schwarzschild coordinates uh, in terms of you know, Schwarzschild time, the usual aerial radius r, and so on. So that's a metric we know. Uh, we know it's an exact solution to the field equations. We know it's an exact solution in vacuum. I'm going to introduce the particle. The particle will have its energy te uh, momentum tensor, and that will be the source of the perturbation. So it's basically what I was telling you before. We, uh, we put the mass. We let it orbit around the black hole. We introduce its energy momentum tensor. I won't write it down explicitly, but it's something that would look like a delta function uh, on the word line of the particle. So it's zero everywhere except on the word line itself. It's infinite on the word line because the mass density is uh, of a point particle is infinite. So we describe this with a delta function, a uh, delta function that has a support on uh, the word line of the particle and taking that word line to be a geodesic of uh, the Schwarzschild space time. So we have the source of the perturbation. It will have m uh, coming in front of that. And I'm thinking of m as my epsilon. It's going to be my expansion parameter here. So. Conceptually, or at least formally, in the way that we described before, all I have to do is to now introduce a metric perturbation. Uh, I will do everything at linear order, so I only introduce P1, which is the first order metric perturbation. 
I might call that g dot, uh, to remind ourselves that this is defined formally as a lambda derivative uh, evaluated at lambda equals zero, so I call it either that or call it that. We are aware now that in order to work this all out, we're going to have to impose some kind of a coordinate condition. It could be the one that I've described before uh, in terms of you know, a generalization of the divergence-free condition. Uh, we won't do that. We could do that. I won't do that here. We're going to have to think about what to do here, but we know that at least uh, formally we will have at some point to restrict the coordinate freedom by imposing that coordinate condition. And then, well, we're, you know, at least in terms of the formal steps, we're pretty much done. All we have to do is to construct the linearized Einstein tensor for my perturbation. That's going to be a linear operator that depends on the background metric that's going to be acting on my uh, perturbation. It's linear. That's why we want to do this. It's perturbation theory. On the right-hand side, we're going to have the energy momentum tensor of the particle evaluated as a function of the background metric. So all of that is exactly what I was telling you before. The only difference is that now I'm thinking very specifically as a Schwarzschild metric as the basis to do all of those calculations. Somehow I solved those equations here with the coordinate condition. I looked at the solution at infinity. I tried to extract from that gravitational waves, and I build those pretty plots that I showed you before. All very straightforward, right? So, you know, I could ask you to go and do that on your own. That could be a nice workshop. But it turns out that, you know, of course, it all looks simple here because I've hidden everything in the notation. Uh, the practicality of doing all of this, uh, of course, is another matter. So, uh, so when you do this in practice, now you have to hand, you know, get your hands dirty, and now it gets messy. And I want to describe some of that messiness because otherwise your life would not be complete. You, you know, you, even if you never do this in your life, you still have to see it once to appreciate what you know all the people who do hard work on this topic have to do for you know for a living. So. Suppose that you take that linearized Einstein tensor and look at it. Well, the, so the, the Einstein tensor is a tensor in the four-dimensional space time. So you can imagine you have 10 independent components for that thing. So your linearized Einstein field equations, sure, they're, lin you know, they're linear equations, but they involve 10 equations for your uh, metric variables. And those, you have six independent ones. After you impose the coordinate conditions, your 10 components of the metric end up giving you six independent components. So now you've got 10 equations for six unknowns. Well, you know that some of those equations are redundant because of the BNP identities. So all the little stuff that you know for exact solutions is just there too. Uh, so anyway, so let's say you have six equations for six unknowns. Uh, each equation uh, is lengthy. Each equation involves all sorts of couplings between all the variables. So it's a mess. It's a big mess. It's a big mess. And you'll see the mess in all its glory, I promise you. But before we see the mess, we have to come up with a way of organizing all those equations and try to pray that along the way, there might be a way of simplifying the mess, maybe decouple the equations from one another. Maybe you can, you know, you can do a lot of preparation work before you actually have to write down uh, and solve uh, the, the perturbation equations. That's where the properties of the background solution become very important. If you do perturbation uh, theory in cosmology and you think that the universe is spatially flat, you will use the spatial flatness of the background solution as a helping way to simplify the equations. And in fact, you can simplify the equations by uh, expanding everything in terms of plane waves. And that's what people do in cosmology. They expand everything in plane waves. And by that, they take care of all the spatial variables. And they end up with a much simpler set of perturbation equations for the time evolution of, uh, of the perturbations. So it becomes very simple because they take you know, advantage of the symmetries of the background solution. Well, here we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to build on one thing, essentially. I could build on the time independence of the metric, and that will be useful later when we think of Fourier transforming. But right now, I really want to take advantage of the spherical symmetry of, uh, of the Schwarzschild solution as a way of simplifying the set of equations and also introducing decouplings between all the variables. <clears throat> 
And you all know about spherical, uh, spherical harmonics. We're going to you know, decompose everything in spherical harmonics. You've done that in quantum mechanics. You know that's the way to handle the hydrogen atom and even do perturbations of hydrogen. So we apply the same spirit here. The only difficulty here is that we're dealing with tensorial quantities, which we need to expand somehow in spherical harmonics. It's very easy to expand scalars in spherical harmonics. We've done this you know, for a long time, starting in you know, quantum mechanics. But when you're dealing with vectors or scalars uh, or tensors, it gets really, really messy to do that, to do this expansion in spherical harmonics. It's worse than this because you read 100 papers on black hole perturbation theory, and you see 100 different conventions for uh, how to do spherical harmonic decomposition. You read Jackson, who does that for e and M, and you see another convention to do uh, you know, vector harmonics in e and M. Uh, you read all papers, they have their own conventions. You, need, you know, read recent papers, they all have different conventions. So it's a bit of a zoo, and it's a bit hard to you know, find your way through that zoo, and it's really a little bit annoying Every author who works on perturbation theory think they have the best convention and the most helpful way of doing it uh, that they know when they should you know, know perfectly well that my way is best. <laughs> That's the sort of a problem. We all think my way is best. No, we all think our way is best. They should all know that my way is best. So I'll describe my way of doing decomposition in, in spherical harmonics, and I'm going to try to demystify this business of constructing vector, uh, vector harmonics and tensor harmonics. And it's not difficult, it's just that there's a lot of details and it's tedious and it's not interesting and it's boring, but again, you know, once in your life you have to be exposed to this if you're gonna call yourself a general relativist. And if you do gravitational wave physics, uh, well, there's a different way of doing spherical harmonics which is based on spin-weighted uh, variables. Anyway, I won't talk about this, but it's all, you know, almost the same thing. So, I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm, I'm going to motivate how we do tensor and vector harmonics. And I think it makes sense if you see it like this, and you'll see where it all comes from. And I think, uh, hopefully, it will demystify this entire uh, business. I, I'm, I'm really tempted to apologize here, because I have way too many slides on this subject. But it's the sort of thing that, unless... If you choose to do it, you have to do it right. If you choose not to do it, you don't do it. But you can't be anywhere in between, because otherwise it's just notation noise. So I chose to do it, so bear with me, please. Okay, so we rely on the spherical symmetry of the base solution to do our business. So it's like doing uh, quantum mechanics with, uh, with the central potential. You rely on the spherical symmetry of the potential. And the first thing you do is to expand the wave function in spherical harmonics. So if we're dealing with a scalar quantity that lives on the two-sphere, a function of two angles on the two-sphere, then we all know about decomposition in spherical harmonics. We can take any function like this, decompose it in spherical harmonics in a sum, double sum over L and M, and we know that we can go back and forth between the function and the expansion coefficients here very easily by just you know, doing integrals. So I won't belabor that. You all know about this. If we're going to do that with tensors, it's not enough to have a functional basis to do stuff. We also need to introduce a tensorial basis. We need a basis uh, not just for the functions, but we need a basis for all the tensorial directions. So let's go slowly and let's think of doing this for vector harmonics. So let's suppose that, so for the time being, I'm going to be thinking in terms of Cartesian 3D space. Let's not worry about anything fancy like 4D space time. I'm just dealing with you know, tensorial quantities in three-dimensional space. I've dealt with the scalar. Let's think of doing something similar for a vector. Well, if I want to deal with vectors, I have to introduce a functional basis. That's going to be the, the y and m's. And I introduce a vector basis to give me three vectorial directions. I need three orthogonal directions to construct a full vector basis. So what can I do? Well, I can start by, so I'm working in spherical coordinates here, so I'm going to distinguish between the radial direction that points away from the sphere and the angular directions that are tangent to the sphere. So I have the radial vector, r hat, or I call it r here, and I have the angular directions that I'll call theta and phi. And you can think of all those vectors as pointing in the direction of the coordinate. So r points in the direction of increasing r, 
theta points in the direction of increasing theta and all that. So, as a first member of my vectorial basis, I can think of taking the radial vector and just multiplying this with the scalar harmonic. And that gives me a functional basis in the spherical harmonics, and it gives me one member of a vectorial basis by choosing this radial direction. So that seems intuitive enough, and that tells me that at least to handle this direction, I don't have to do very much more than what we do for scalars. So I think that's okay, that's good. That defines a vector. So as a second member, of course, I've already, uh, I've already dealt with the radial direction, so what I need to do now is to take two more vectors that will be orthogonal to that radial vector, which means that now I'm looking at the tangential directions on the sphere. And one way of generating one tangential direction is to start from a spherical harmonic and take a gradient. If I take a gradient of a function of theta and phi, I will have a superposition of a theta derivative along theta and a phi derivative along phi. So by taking a gradient of a spherical harmonic, automatically I generate one tangential direction on the sphere that's guaranteed to be orthogonal to the radial direction. So that puts me in good shape. I have two vectorial directions. All I need is a third vectorial direction. And uh, all I need for that is, to be, is for it to be orthogonal to the other two. And I know how to take two vectors and build a vector out of that that's going to be orthogonal to that vector. I use a cross product, right? So that's what I'll do here. I'll take the cross product between my gradient here and the radial vector. And if I do that, well, it's still going to have to be orthogonal to this vector and that vector. So it's still going to be a tangential direction on the sphere. And if you work it out, it's going to be a phi derivative along minus theta and a theta derivative along phi. I'm not normalizing things here, so don't worry about that. But the point is that by using the cross product here, I have automatically a vector that's going to be orthogonal, that's guaranteed to be orthogonal to the first two I have here. So the strategy is pretty simple to construct a, vector, a vectorial basis. I single out the radial direction, I single out the gradient, and then I just solve for the third direction by making sure it's orthogonal to, to the, the first two, and I use the cross product to do that. Uh, you could choose to ask me at some point, what would I do if I were not in 3D uh, space, but if my two sphere was an n-sphere? If I'm dealing with an n-sphere, I don't have a cross product, so I have to be a lot more you know, inventive. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I could describe this, but I won't. So, all that, so what that tells me here, and I think it, it demystifies the subject, all, that tell, you know, all of this is just saying that I can get a vectorial basis from a scalar basis by just doing very simple manipulation. One point I wanted to emphasize is that the radial vector and the gradient are both honest vectors. As soon as I involve the cross product, I'm not dealing with a vector anymore. I'm dealing with what's called either a pseudo vector or an axial vector. And th these vectors behave differently if you do parity transformation. And that's something that will you know, be part of the story a little bit later on. So I have two vectors and one axial vector or pseudo vector, but that's fine, it works. The other thing that I'm not saying here, and that turns out to be important, is that you would like your vectorial basis to have a decent, a decent description in terms of how the Laplacian acts on these things. So the, uh, the spherical harmonic itself is useful because if you act on it with the Laplacian on the sphere, it gives you L times L plus one times the spherical harmonic itself. So you end up generating the eigenvalue equation by acting on the, uh, on the spherical harmonic with the Laplacian on the sphere. So what you would want your vectorial basis uh, to also have is some kind of decent, uh, you know, decent uh, behavior if you were to apply a Laplacian operator uh, on, on these things. You would like the, these things here to also give you an eigenvalue problem for the vectorial harmonics, and that would guarantee that when you uh, separate variables that you generate something that doesn't mix different L's together and things like that. So I'm, I'm not dwelling on this, uh, but it turns out that this way of doing things guarantees that. In the end, you'll end up with decoupled equations if you work uh, with a spherical symmetric background. This vectorial basis will give you decoupled equations so that each L, quantity, each L mode will not couple to, uh, to other. So it's not obvious that all of that is true, but what I wanted to really indicate is how you can easily construct a vectorial basis if you start from the sphere. Uh, 
if you get that, then you can do tensors because to do tensors is just you know more of the same. So any uh, any questions at this point? Okay, so now you're experts in uh, vector harmonics. Uh, we can do uh, tensors, but I'll delay that for just one more slide. Uh, right now, I was using a Cartesian language. And it's going to be useful to proceed to actually think of doing everything in, uh, in spherical coordinates. So before, I was thinking of vectors as being functions of theta and phi, but I was still describing them in terms of Cartesian directions. If I'm going to do, uh, you know, if I'm going to keep doing this uh, and going to uh, eventually 4D space time, it's going to be useful to think of expressing components of vectors and tensors eventually in angular uh, components. So I'm going to go away from the Cartesian, you know, uh, description of components to an angular uh, description. So what I will have is the radial component of the vector. And I will have the angular component of the vector, and those uh, I will lump into this unified notation here, where the capital A index will mean either theta or phi. So I just basically consider all three directions, one radial, two angular. The radial component of my vector is something that's going to be decomposed in terms of the radial basis I introduced on the previous slide, and that just means that the radial component of my vector will be decomposed as if I were dealing with a scalar. I decompose that in terms of scalar harmonics. That's just being, you know, doing exactly the same thing I was doing here. Instead of call, so here I was putting the radial direction in front of my scalar harmonic. I take this out by taking a radial projection. So I can treat my radial component here as a scalar when I do the uh, spherical harmonic decomposition. When I look at the angular components, well now I'm going to deal with the two tensors, or the two vectors that I had that describe tangential, tangential directions on the sphere. So I'm going to have a decomposition in terms of the, the second member of the basis and uh, a decomposition in terms of the third member of the basis. So when I'm dealing with the angular components of my vector, I have two types of spherical harmonics, one corresponding to the gradient that I introduced before, the other one corresponding to the cross product I introduced before. The only difference is that before I was doing it in the Cartesian language, now I'm doing everything in components. So what I have to do is to convert that cross product and the gradient into, uh, into that component language. And that's where the notation starts becoming a little bit you know, unfamiliar, but think of it as being exactly the same thing. So this guy is the gradient uh, member that I had before. This guy is the cross product member that I had before. When we translate everything in terms of components, these vectorial harmonics here are simply derivatives of the scalar harmonics. That's the gradient operation we had before. Now I'm describing it in terms of theta and phi derivatives. But it's exactly the same operation we had before. The cross product is something that gets expressed now not in terms of the three-dimensional perturbation symbol, but it becomes expressed in terms of the two-dimensional version of this, which I call the levi chemita tensor on the two-sphere. So it's basically the three-dimensional perturbation symbol to which you attach uh, a radial vector, and you use that to construct the cross-product between r hat and the gradient operator. That gets transformed into a two-dimensional permutation symbol acting on the derivative. So it's exactly the same thing, it's just that it's been recast into this angular notation. But, you know, I think you can still see the relationship. This is just the gradient we had before. This is the new expression for the same cross product we had before. If I want to expand a vector on the two-sphere in terms of spherical harmonics, I need two different set of, uh, of spherical harmonics, one defined by taking just a derivative, the other one coming from that sort of skewed uh, you know, gradient operation. So now I'm shifting my point of view a little bit. I'm going to start thinking of what used to be a vector as a collection of what looks, uh, of something that looks like a scalar on the two sphere and something that looks like a vector on the two sphere. So I used to think of a vector as something, uh, you know, that looks like an arrow in three dimensional space, but now I'm thinking of describing all of this as if I lived in that two dimensional subspace, the two sphere. And I'm going to distinguish 
what carries an angular component, that I'm going to call a vector, to something that doesn't, that I'm going to call a scalar. And for my purposes here, it doesn't matter whether that scalar is the radial component of a vector in 3D or a true scalar in 3D. It behaves exactly the same way when I do the circle harmonic decomposition. So I call it a scalar on S2. This I will call a vector on S2. I need two members of the basis for this. I need one member of the basis for that. It's all the same thing, but now it's a notation that approaches what actually is used in black hole perturbation theory. So if you got all of this, at least in spirit, uh, then uh, again, the step to doing tensors is basically just more of that. So if anything needs clarification now, I think uh, it would be a good time. Yeah. Um, so I might be very stupid and probably am. How can we express can we express this in terms of spin plus minus one circle? Yeah. So what you could do, and that's the way to relate uh, those vectoral harmonics to spin-weighted spherical harmonics, is you could think of taking those uh, those vectors on the two sphere and projecting them against the tetrad of you know a complex tetrad. Uh, on the two sphere uh, that you define to be basically a complex defined vector that has a null norm uh, by virtue of the complex conjugation. So you use that as a vector basis. When you do the projection of this onto that tetrad, you obtain scalars, but those are not, you know, the same scalar as this. They become spin weighted scalars, and those can be expanded in terms of their own spherical harmonics that turn out to be just this combined with the tetrad. And those are the spin weighted square harmonics. So yeah, that's the, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah. So some people really like spin weighted square harmonics. I'm, you know, I, I've used them in the past, uh, but it's just basically an alternative to doing uh, an explicit uh, vectorial decomposition like that. And it works for tensors as well. Yeah. Good question. Nothing, nothing stupid. So you should never worry about being stupid. I should worry about being I, stupid I because I'm being recorded. Sorry. Uh, don't worry about being too quite proud. <laughs> no, no, it's not true. Uh, other questions? Okay, so let's see if we can uh, take this to tensors. And I just want to check the time. Um, who can tell me the time? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Okay, so I think I'll I'll be able to wrap this up. Uh, so, when we do tensors, of course, the story complicates a little bit, but because instead of having this segregation between radial component and angular component, like we had for, for vectors, now we have more, uh, you know, more quantities to deal with. So, when I'm looking for, I'm still working in 3D space here, so, uh, so when I'm talking about a tensor, I'll be talking about the symmetric tensor, just to simplify things, uh, that's going to be enough for our purposes. When we look at the tensor, well, I can be looking at the radial radial components. I can be looking at the mixture between radial and angular components. Or I can look purely at the uh, tensorial components, the angular components. Right? So if I'm thinking three-dimensionally, of course, I'm talking about uh, you know, all of those components of a tensor. But if, if I'm thinking on, you know, on the two spheres as I did before, I'm going to call this a scalar because it has nothing to do with angular components. So that's just as good a scalar as a true scalar would be. That I'm going to think as a vector on the two sphere because it only has one angular you know, component. The other one is radial. And this I'm going to think as a symmetric two, uh, tensor on the two sphere. So my view of my tensorial description now is really tied to a two-dimensional sphere. So that's a scalar, that's a vector, that's, uh, that's a tensor. We know how to deal with this, we know how to deal with that, we don't have to do anything more here. The only thing that we have to do that's not covered already is how to do a spherical harmonic decomposition of that tensor. So I'm still assuming that it's symmetric. I'm going to do what you always do when you're dealing with complicated things. You should reduce them down to their most you know, simplest, uh, their, their simplest pieces, the irreducible pieces. So what I'm going to do here is to resolve that symmetric tensor into a trace and a trace-free part. So you know that's always very beneficial to take a complicated tensor and re reduce it down to irreducible pieces. And here I do that by just taking out the trace and looking at the trace-free combination. Uh, the trace just means that I'm going to look at the piece of the 
uh, of the tensor that is proportional to the metric on the unit two sphere. So my uh, omega quantity here is just uh, the metric on the unit two sphere. So the familiar expression over here. The metric is gamma, is omega here. And a piece of that tensor will be proportional to the metric. That piece with a factor of one half is the trace of the tensor. And what remains is going to be the symmetric trace free part. So how do you get the trace? Well, you just calculate the trace. And that just means taking the tensor, multiplying that by the inverse metric that builds the trace. And the symmetric trace free is just basically taking the difference between this and that. If you take out the trace, of course, what remains is uh, trace foo. So this tensor, uh, as a tensor on the 2C, has three independent components. If I uh, take out the trace, I get out one component, and this contains two, you know, uh, two independent pieces of information. So I have a three-component thing, or three-element thing, that gets split into one and two. That V, when I look at it on the sphere, is a scalar. And I know how to deal with scalars, so I don't have to do anything new with this one. The only thing I have to deal with now is that symmetric trace-free part of that tensor. I have to come up with a spherical harmonic basis to describe only this. Everything else is covered already. So how do we do that? Well, now you deal specifically with this, and we have the complete story. So how did I go from a scalar basis to a vectorial basis? I basically took gradients either in the direct way or in the cross-product way. If it worked from going to scalar to vectors, surely it will work also from going to vectors to tensors. So I will generate the tensorial basis of harmonics by starting out with my vector harmonics and taking more derivatives. That's all you need to do. So let me describe how it's done. Here I'm displaying the decompositions. I have my scalar quantity here, VRR, that's decomposed in a scalar harmonic. I have my vectorial quantity here, remember, is decomposed into two types of vectorial harmonics. The one's coming from the gradient, the other one coming from the cross product. And now I'm dealing with the tensor, so what I'm going to do here is to separate out the trace. That's the piece of the tensor that's proportional to the metric. What remains is a scalar quantity that will be decomposed in terms of scalar harmonics. So all of this is old stuff. The new stuff is here. I need two you know, tensor harmonics to get rid of my, uh, to, to account for the, uh, the, the trace free combination that had two independent quantities in it. So I need two tensorial decompositions to handle the fact that my symmetric trace free uh, piece of my tensor has two independent components. I've dealt with the scalar here. That's the remaining pieces. So those two things here are the new ingredients that I need and what I do uh, to uh, deal with this is to basically take additional gradients. So for the vector harmonics, I applied one derivative on the scalar harmonics. What I'm going to do for the tensor harmonics here is to apply two derivatives. And here I you know, describe it as D, uh, and that's just my notation for what I mean by covariant differentiation on the unit 2 sphere. So I have the unit 2 sphere, I have a metric on that, I have a connection compatible with the metric, that's the derivative operator that's compatible with the metric on the unit 2 sphere. So I just do covariant derivatives on the unit 2 sphere, and I, I get you know, something that looks like a tensorial basis because I have two tensor indices here. But what I need is a tensor basis that will be trace-free because I've already, already accounted for the trace here. I can do that by adding this term. So take two derivatives, add a term for, you know, multiplying the metric, and I claim that this combination is actually trace-free. And in fact, I can prove that it's trace-free because to prove that it's trace-free, what's the trace? I multiply this by the inverse metric. That's the trace. If I multiply this by the inverse metric, I get the Laplacian on the sphere. If I multiply this by the inverse metric, I have the inverse multiplying itself, I get one. Well, I get the one half because it's the trace of the inverse metric, so it's two. So I have Laplacian on y plus L, L plus one on y. What is that? Zero. Zero. That's the eigenvalue equation for y. Remember, the eigenvalue equation for y is Laplacian on y 
is equal to minus L L plus one times Y. That's exactly what I have here. So those two derivatives plus this added term over here give me a tensorial spherical harmonic that is trace free and therefore perfectly suitable to be inserted here. I'm missing one, I'm missing that guy over here. Well, the key to do that is to keep uh, involving that Levitch-Levita tensor because that incorporates the cross product part that I had over here. So all I have to do now is to go back to the vectorial, in the, uh, the vectorial uh, harmonics over here and take additional derivatives based on that. There's an epsilon buried in here and that's enough to guarantee that this has all the right properties, including the property of being trace-free. I won't prove that for you here, but it's easy. Think of the epsilon that lives in here. The epsilon is oblivious to the covariant derivative. So you can take it out. You have two derivatives acting on y, multiplying an epsilon. The two derivatives commute. The epsilon anti-commutes, you get zero. So what we have here are basically two tensorial structures that uh, form the required tensorial basis. And now we have a complete composition for everything. So at this point, it gets a little bit technical in all of this, but I hope you follow the, the story starting from the, from the start. And the whole key was to just look at gradient operations to define all the relevant tensor, uh, you know, tangential direction on the sphere. And uh, eventually, we end up with this. And now we have a complete decomposition of a symmetric tensor on, uh, on the sphere. To build it up to space-time will be a trivial step. That's really uh, all there is to it. You have a question? So if you have another connection, you will need to find other decompositions? So if I, by hand, introduce a different connection on the sphere? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I would do exactly the same, but now it would be defined in terms of that new connection. Yeah. So what you have here, so think back of the, uh, of the issue I raised before about making sure that this has a decent property under uh, under the Laplacian operation. So, I, so I, I'm not displaying this here, but I would want, I would hope that those tensor harmonics behave nicely if I were to act on them with the Laplacian operator. And uh, it turns out that they have a very nice eigenvalue property that I rely on when I decouple all my equations. If I were to introduce a different connection, I would lose all of this because, you know, what looks nice in one connection wouldn't, wouldn't look nice in some of the correction. But, you know, in principle, you're right. You could, all of this relies on the choice of connection. Okay. So I'm just about done, and I think it will be a good time to stop after the next slide, where I basically tell you what needs to be done in space-time. But if you follow the story so far, it's really nothing more, because what was important previously in three-dimensional space was to distinguish between the purely angular directions and uh, anything that didn't have anything to do with the angles. So anything that didn't have anything to do with angular components, I uh, was calling a, a scalar. And uh, you know, anything that had one uh, angular component uh, you know, index, I called a vector, and so on. So when I move to space-time, it really doesn't change anything. In space-time, I have more components to deal with. But there's a bunch of components, t, 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 r, p, uh, and r, r, that have nothing to do with angular components. Those are called scalars. They're all scalars that I think of living on the two sphere, and on the two sphere they behave as scalars. Then you all have the mixed components between T and R here and theta and phi here. The explicit listing is over here. So anything that has one angular component to it, I call a vector on the two sphere. And finally, I have all the angular components and those behave as tensors on the sphere. So when I do my spherical harmonic decomposition, I can think of all of these things here as scalars. I can think of all of these things here as vectors. And I can think of these things as tensors. So it's basically all the same compared to what we did before. So now I can introduce a complete decomposition of all of my tensor components in terms of spherical harmonics. We have the scalar, we have the two vectors, and then for a tensor, we have the trace part involving a scalar decomposition, and then the trace-free part that involves their own you know, symmetric trace-free uh, tensor harmonics. What I'm writing down here is actually a decomposition of the metric, but I could be describing any tensor that I wish to decompose in spherical harmonics would be exactly the same. If I'm doing for the metric, then there's some traditional names that are attached to the Fourier coefficients, uh, sorry, the, the, the spherical harmonic uh, uh, you know, coefficients, 
And this uh, is used in the language of, you know, in the literature in lack of perturbation theory. So I think I'll stop here now, and I'll start from here again tomorrow, and I'll introduce the notation and uh, proceed from there. But what I hope, you know, I've achieved now is hopefully a demystification of what it means to do tensor, uh, you know, uh, decompositions in spherical harmonics. I hope you followed the thread of ideas. The technical details are still, you know, a little bit messy, but I hope at least the story makes sense uh, to you. And I hope that I convinced you that this is a wonderful basis to work from. It's the best, and therefore <laughs> you should only work with this and forget about all the millions of other conventions that have been introduced by everybody who's done things like that, uh, including many people in this room. Okay, thank you. Enough for today. Thanks. <laughs>